Hi, welcome to Brookdale's Writer Series. I'm Laura McCullough, and I am speaking today with B.J. Ward, New Jersey poet. B.J. is the recipient of a Pushcart Prize for Poetry, and he has had two New Jersey State Arts Council fellowships. That's quite an accomplishment. You can only have three in a lifetime. He's been widely published in uh, journals such as Mid-American Review, Poetry, Painted Bride Quarterly, Tri-Quarterly, and numerous others. His poem, for the Children of the World Trade Center Victims is cast in bronze and is featured at Grounds for Sculpture, a wonderful sculpture garden in uh, Mercer County. B.J. is an assistant professor of English at Warren County Community College and has three collections of poetry. His first is Landing in New Jersey with Soft Hands, which was followed by the exquisite 17 po Love Poems with No Despair and his most recent collection of poems, Grave Digger's Birthday, one of my personal favorites. And I am delighted to have you here today, BJ. Well, it's a Good pleasure to be back. You. Thank you very much. Good. Um, what I'd like to ask you first is to go back a little bit and think about your roots as a New Jerseyite mm. and as a writer and how those two things came into confluence. It's really been a theme, um, more so in the early work, but it has continued through Gravedigger's mm. birthday. How did you come to be a writer? How does New Jersey matter to you? Well, well, it's an interesting uh, question. I, being a writer isn't a job. You know, it's a calling. I mean, if you really want to do it, it's it's a calling. And if you don't make any money, you, you still do it. And that's part of being a writer. Um, I, I'm the only one in my family to go to college. You know, my, my father dropped out of school in eighth grade. My mother was a waitress all her life, and my brother's an electrician. And so in many ways, I became kind of a black sheep of the family for wanting to live a life of ideas. When did you start knowing that there was a difference between you and your family? Well, I wouldn't say there's much of a difference, actually. I, uh, there's, I, we just have slightly different interests in this one area. And how did you become aware of that? Hmm. I don't know. I don't know. I, I was ashamed of it when I did become aware of it. I became a closet poet in high school. Wow. And I had a great high school teacher named Ed Ramon who'd, who'd say, here. A great writer. Uh, yeah, yeah, terrific. Uh, New Jersey poet who now lives in Pennsylvania. And he, he'd say, listen, write, write a poem. I say, get the hell out of here. You know, poetry is for girls and wimps. I'm not going to do that. Come on. And he, he did something extraordinary. He came in the next day and read to my class a William Butler Yeats poem called When You Are Old, which is all about mm -hmm. unrequited love. Mm -hmm. And it nailed me. I mean, that was about me, me and Nancy Brickman, who, who was a ballerina, for God's sake, and the most graceful thing I'd ever seen, and who didn't know I existed. She was this other ninth grade student. And so I said, I can write better than that Yates guy, right? So I went home and I wrote a horrible poem. And I rode my bike to school six miles the next day because I didn't want any of the kids on the bus seeing me show them a poem. And, uh, and he found some things to praise in it. He found some things to praise. And so he started doing these little deals, like giving me these assignments on crumpled up balls of paper and he'd slip them to me. Yeah, you know, like, like I see drug deals done in the movies. Yeah, and, I, yeah, and I'd walk away and, I, yeah, yeah, and I'd write a poem for a couple of days. I'd go back to him and I'd give him a crumpled up piece of paper and he'd open it and respond. And this occurred for about three or four years. I was a senior in high school. Did your family know anything about this? Did anyone else know? My mother knew. Your mother My mother knew. found a poem I'd written when I was in 11th grade. And, and she handled it well. She was a little worried. She, she was like, what the hell is this? But, but she, she said, hey, you know, you're just a weird kid. Okay, write your poems. And, and she was okay with it. She never told my father. My brother would just ridicule me endlessly, so he never found out. And uh, then in 12th grade, I won the Trenton State College Poetry Contest for high school students. And my car, it was this 1970 Plymouth Fury. It was half rust, half Bondo, you know, it was blue <laughs> smoke coming out from burning the oil. And it broke down on Route 31, halfway to the, to the conference, and, and I never made it. And I, I won 100 bucks, and I never could pick it up. And so the, the Trenton State College, which is now the college in New Jersey, right. called my high school Monday morning. And they said, listen, he, he never made it. He never made it. Where is he? And Mrs. McGovero, that's how she found out, the secretary found out that I won this big contest in the state. So unbeknownst to me, this is all transpiring in the office. I'm in my homeroom with the other W's, including- W's, what does that mean? Well, I'm a <clears throat> I'm Ward. Oh, with the other, with the <laughs> Ward, okay. okay. So I'm there with Glenn Wilkinson, 
Not, not like the Group W bench, though. The Arlo yeah, Guthrie, no, no. no, no. It's, I'm in there with uh, Wilkinson, who's the captain of the basketball team, captain of the football team, big guy. And I'm this, like, greasy loser, you know, listen to Tom Waits in the corner, you know. And, and he, um, the, it came over the loudspeaker, congratulations to B.J. Ward for winning the New Jersey Poetry Contest. You were outed. I was outed as a poet. They <laughs> outed me. And I was upset, and everyone looked at me, and Wilkinson looked at me, this big behemoth of a, of a slab of meat, looked at me, and he said, that's you. <laughs> I said, yeah, yeah, that's me. And he did something extraordinary, Laura. He said, all right, state champ. And he started oh. clapping. He didn't oh. get poetry, but he, but he understood got, winning. Yeah, he and he got, got state winning. champ. And yes, yeah, state champ, yeah. winning was what it was. Mm -hmm. And then everybody started clapping for me in my homeroom. And there were about four days left of school before we graduated. And for those four days, <laughs> Nancy Brickman <laughs> knew my name. <laughs> and that, but it was um, too late for me. <laughs> and you, you had four days of glory there. The four days of glory, and I graduated and went back into the unknown. So. Okay. So that's how I became, yeah. That's how you started that's with how poetry. I started, yeah. And you have Ed Ramon to thank for that. Oh, yeah, huge. I mean, uh, praise to the teachers. Yeah. You know, the thankless work of a, of a New Jersey teacher. Now, we have New Jersey to talk about. We have mom and dad to talk about. There's a lot in yeah. what you just said. We've yeah. got class. But I, I want to harken back to mom because I know I've told you this, but I'm going to tell you again. When Gravedigger's birthday came in the mail, was in my mailbox when I ordered it, I opened it up before I got to the driveway. I'm rifling through yeah. it, and I get to the poem with maybe one of the longest titles I have ever seen. You know the one I'm talking about. Upon being asked why I dedicated my first book to my mother when there's not a single poem in there about her. Mm. Now this is the third book. We're talking about the first book. Right. Can you talk about that poem? Do you want to talk a little bit about your mom sure. and maybe about your dad who in the little history you've just given us at that point still doesn't know you're a writer? Well, my mother, you know, was something extraordinary and it, you know, uh, to get into that, I have to say a little bit about my family history. Without getting too much into it, my father was a drunk, and he was a violent drunk. And God bless him, he's been sober now for almost two decades, and I'm very proud of him. But there was a lot of anger to get through about that, uh, especially about the violence that occurred when he got drunk. And it wasn't until I forgave my father fully that I could write, I hope, well mm -hmm. about that situation. And there is no mm -hmm. greater joy in this world than true forgiveness. Mm -hmm. I'm mean, not like you're holding back something like you're going to bring it up someday. Mm -hmm. Really forgiving. And um, it was when that happened that I could start writing the poems that ended up in Grave Digger's mm -hmm. Birthday, which is the third book. Which the are authentic and brave. Thanks. But they're not, they don't seem to have a hidden agenda. They're not in order to reveal something about family. They're really no. artistically rendered versions of that no, I mean, they're, they're Eugene Harrigal in the Zen and the Art of Archery said the only target you ever try to hit is yourself. Hmm. And I think that applies to poetry, too. And hmm. when I'm writing and it's on, you know, I'm discovering stuff about myself that I didn't know I knew. And mm -hmm. so really that Gravedigger's birthday is really an exorcism mm -hmm. um, of my own demons, not necessarily my father's. It's dealing with, because he'd already done the hard work of sobriety. It was up to me to reach forgiveness, which can be very difficult. Which is your own issue and separate mm -hmm. from your father's. But to render it artistically, what's really interesting about this particular collection is that it deals with subject matter that is not often dealt with. What kind of responses since the book came out, it's been a few years now, have you gotten from people who may have resonated very much toward the class issues, the father issues, the anger issues that you were able to explore to, here? To my face overwhelmingly positive responses, which is the nature of people talking to your face. Outside of that, I don't know. I know that my mother, talking about that one poem, is still afraid the cops are going to show up because of what I say in the no. poem. Yeah. And that's wow. my mom. And I love her, and I love her with all my heart. But that, that's my mom. The poem you're talking about, that, you, that we start mm -hmm. talking about, talks about the extreme indigence that a family endures when one of the heads of the household um, has a substance abuse problem, whether it's alcohol, drugs, whatever, prescription drugs, mm -hmm. the money's gone. Mm -hmm. Where's the money? And so I grew up poor, really poor. And at one point in eighth grade, I started, I was asked to read Flowers for Algernon. And you know, more than 
two-syllable words. Any, anything more than a monosyllabic word really wasn't said at the dinner table. So two syllables was pushing it. Then we got into three-syllable words in this book, and I had no idea what they meant. And my mother did something extraordinary. She stole a dictionary um, because there was no money, and I was getting Fs in school. She stole a dictionary, and that's what that poem's about. And so if I can see the first book, the white one. The white one. You know, so my books are all red, white, and blue. That's because I'm proud to be an American. <laughs> um, and a New Jersey. In New Jersey. This one is for my mother. Mm -hmm. But there's not a single poem in here about her. So for years, people ask me, why is that book dedicated to your mother and there's not a poem about, in there about her? Well, that's why. Because mm -hmm. she really helped enable my reading life. And a reading life, you know, that's one of the great things about public libraries is it doesn't matter how rich you are. You have the same, the access to the same books that students at Princeton have, right. that, that, that the richest people in the world have, you have access in your public library, especially now through interlibrary loan. Right. And now on the internet too, that, that's changed. Absolutely, um, of course for, I'm talking about when I was growing and... up, there was no internet. So, so this is, you know, it, it, my mind found the food it was hungry for. It, the, the books were, were ropes let down to the lost. Mm -hmm. And I followed these books out of that mm -hmm. place I was in and ended up and your you know, mom becoming a writer. was willing to indict herself. I'm sure that was an incredibly difficult thing for her to do against her value system. Yeah. You say she's still afraid the police are going oh, yeah, to come yeah. to and her. Oh, yeah, yeah, and she's a very honest woman. Son. And, uh, you know, that's the, I mean, I think that's one of the reasons it might be a good subject for a poem is because it's a morally gray area. Mm -hmm. She stole. It's wrong. She's a devout Catholic. It, she broke one of the Ten Commandments. At the same time, she saw her son suffering with no way out. Maybe I should read the poem. Well, I'm going to ask you to hold on that for just okay. a moment because we're going to get ready to take a break and okay. then we're going to come back. If we could open the next section with you reading it, that would be wonderful. Why don't we do that? Okay. This is Brookdale's Writer's Series. This is B.J. Ward, a terrific poet and a devout New Jerseyan and uh, an American. Please come back with us for the second half. He's going to read a poem and we're going to talk some more. Thank you. This is fine. Thanks. The odds of a child becoming a professional athlete are 1 in 16,000. The odds of a child being diagnosed with autism, 1 in 166. The odds say it's time to listen. To learn the signs of autism, visit AutismSpeaks.org. Welcome back to Brookdale's Writers Series. I'm Laura McCullough, and I'm talking with poet B.J. Ward. When we left on the break, B.J. was about to read one of his poems from his collection, Gravedigger's Birthday. Please do it for us. Upon being asked why I dedicated my first book to my mother when there's not a single poem in there about her. As Prometheus must have pocketed fire, slipping it from Olympus in the folds of his compassion and duplicity. So my mother stole a Webster's Pocket Dictionary. The Mansfield Jamesway department store was all discounts and lighting that refused to flatter. Commerce sliding through its aisles as my mother slipped that book into her jacket, getting 30,000 words fatter. I know the arguments. That's stealing. What about the owner? What about teaching her son what's right? In truth, the entire Jamesway Corporation would go out of business 21 years later. And I'm sure it had to do with the Webster's Riverside Pocket Dictionary, whose pages held all the words of Ulysses and Paradise Lost and Look Homeward Angel. 
but jumbled in alphabetical order. What can I say? She stole a dictionary from me because there were no words a judge could use that would be worse than her son starving for a lexicon he could grip like a wrench and loosen all those dumb bolts in his brain. Receiving that dictionary taught me rectitude and the many dictates that come down from its cloistral mountaintop. I was suddenly rich, a son from the most Id indigent family in Hampton. How lucky. When I first started to rub against my language, sidle up to my own tongue, my mother stole me a book. Years later, I gave her one back. That is a beautiful poem. Thank you, Laura. Thank you for asking about it. Thank you for reading it. And, and I have to say, it is a very good example of a B.J. Ward poem, one that is authentically uh, emotional. It drives a very hard emotional punch, but you are a word right. You are a word smith. There's a great deal of attention to language. Your craft is impeccable. I'd like to hear you talk for a moment about the training that you've had as a writer, who your other influences have been. Well, you know, I think my training as a writer really began with rock and roll. Mm -hmm. um, because the books weren't in my house. Mm -hmm. And I, when I was young, I got into, I had mentioned Tom Waits, but there were, certainly before that, there was Billy Joel. You know, mm -hmm. Springsteen's huge, he's still huge in my life. You wanted me to mention Stone Pony right around <laughs> well, the corner that, from yeah, us. My friend Paulie and I used to always go down Stone Pony hoping to catch him. I don't think we ever did there. I mean, we've been to lots of his concerts, but, but there was this band called Cats on a Smooth Surface. He used to play back in the early 80s. This guy, Glenn Burtnick. Would be in charge. And there was this other guy, John Eddy, who's still singing and doing, and Glenn is too, I guess. But, uh, you know, just, just watching the audience around me. I mean, I would watch the musicians and listen and be into it. But I was fascinated by the crowd and how a great musician can kind of create these, these arcs in an evening. And I tried to, to learn from that. And then it was an easy jump then to Mark Twain, because <laughs> Mark Twain does the same thing. <laughs> And then, then it was another little jump to Faulkner. And then, you know, Carver, Raymond Carver, who absolutely does it. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's the same just, mountain, just different You're paths. largely talking about prose so far, although, you know, Carver wrote poetry as well. Yeah. But how about the poets that you, you learned from, I didn't from, find any read? poets in my childhood, because I was forced to read the greats. And I wasn't good enough yet to get what the greats were doing. Not growing up in my family, I couldn't get what Auden was doing or Shakespeare. I mean, I just couldn't. But then when I was in college, so I had this great teacher. And how did you get to Stockton? How did that leap happen? I went as far away from my parents as I could while paying in-state rates. paying in-state rates. I went to Richard Stockton College uh -huh. and had a remarkable teacher who was maybe the greatest influence on my writing. His name is Stephen Dunn, a friend of yours. Mm -hmm. And uh, he won the Pulitzer Prize in the year 2001. Mm -hmm. And I had him, of course, way before then. He, uh, he taught me that even though I didn't write like him, my voice was genuine too. Mm -hmm. And it just needed a little crafting. Now, how about that crafting? How about the aesthetics? What has been your experience over the course of the three books? Uh, it, it's a tightening. It's a tightening, but the problem with tightening is sometimes you can tighten something so much the music goes out of it, mm. that, that, that the feeling goes out. And so for me, it's always been a... a everyone knows the William Carlos Williams quote, if it ain't a pleasure, it ain't a poem. Mm -hmm. I actually like a, an Auden quote a little better, W.H. Auden, who said, pleasure isn't the most... It, uh, pleasure isn't an infallible guide but it is the least fallible guide. <laughs> and, and I try to put pleasure in my poems for the reader. Now, the problem with that is I just don't want to be an entertainer. Mm -hmm. I also want to unearth stuff, which I think is the job of the artist, to find out stuff about yourself in the course of writing, but to include that external audience. So it's, it's a constant. Con I, I love Ross Gay, who was interviewed here already. And he, uh, when he introduces with? himself, when he introduces himself, he says, I heard him do this backstage. He said, someone asked him, are you a fiction writer? He said, no, I write poems. He doesn't say, I'm a poet. 
And that's a very important distinction. Robert Frost once said the term poet is a term of respect and should only be applied to others, never oneself. Hmm. And I, I see Ross through his work and through his person living up to that. Mm -hmm. And I say that my books aren't quite poetry yet. They aspire to be, but I keep trying to get better.